Welcome to the Rediscover You in Midlife Pod Summit, hosted by The Roller Coaster. My name is Lucy Q. Five years ago, the emotional turmoil of midlife turned my life into a shitstorm. To make things worse, I had no idea that my chaotic emotions were due to the roller coaster of midlife. I thought I was crazy and I felt completely alone. I've come to realize that midlife is more than a list of symptoms that we have to injure or cure. Midlife is the beginning of our next chapters. This is our time to be heard, to live our best lives, and to fix those pesky hormones. Join me as I chat with experts and industry leaders about nutrition, bone health, hormones, mindset, healing, journaling, living life to the fullest, and yes, even sex. I'm inviting you to throw your head back, arms in the air, and come along with me for the ride. Welcome to the Rediscover You in Midlife Pod Summit. I'm your host, Lucy Q, and joining me today is Alana Fuaxis. Ela- Alana, rather, Eleni. <laughs> <laughs> See, here we go, right off the bat, I'm stumbling, but this is real life, and real life is not perfect. Eleni is a model actress turned children's author, educator, and entrepreneur who is looking to inspire women to follow their gut, make bold moves to write their book, change their career, and get out of their toxic relationships and to start living the life they deserve. Welcome. Amen. Thank you. (laughs) Thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here, Lucy. Oh, okay. So here we get going and you know, it's always, you tr- you try so hard not to do something and then you do it. <laughs> and then I just got completely that right? That's how life works, right? And, you know, and we were talking about that, but before we hit record is yeah. that, and especially, you know, I'm sure you can speak to this. Is it so often in life, we see the glamorous side. So for you as a model and actress, you know, people are looking at you in those star roles on the camera, on the pages. Mm -hmm. And it's really easy to forget that there's a person behind those images. And that person has real life challenges, especially when it comes to dealing with midlife. So could you maybe start off by sharing some insight into your life as a model and actress and maybe how your midlife journey has impacted all of that? Sure. I have been in the acting and modeling industry for over two decades here in New York, and I'm still in the business. It did get annihilated during COVID and overnight. And I, you know, am a divorced single mom and I was literally at home with the rest of the world trying to figure out how am I going to support my children to get remote, you know, online learning and education. And also what am I going to do to support myself and my family? And I have to say, Lucy, what I recognize in that moment is this is, you know, an opportunity to reassess what am I doing in my life? Am I adding value? And the resounding answer was no, no, (laughs) definitely not. And although I was really proud 
of my accomplishments as an actress, as a model. Listen, I was a late bloomer, okay? I started at the age of 30. 30 years old in New York is, you're a dinosaur. <laughs> you're ancient creatures at the age of 30. Think about starting a modeling career at the age of 30. I didn't know anybody. I didn't have any contacts. People said to me, you're too short. You're too fat. You're so average. Like, heard it from everybody and pressed on and I'm still going. However, you know, looking back, I did take that time to reassess. And I, I said to myself, I don't feel like this is my life's purpose. I don't feel like this will be my legacy. Is this really all I want to be remembered for? And it made me, I had this void inside me. And then what happened is I started reflecting and meditating as I love to do and getting quiet and still. And I had um, an aunt of mine that reached out to me and said, you know what, Eleni? She's, you know, been an educator her whole life. She was an assistant principal and a teacher. And she said, they're in dire need. They are looking for teachers. People, teachers are getting sick. Teachers are quitting, walking off the job. and you should really look at this. And she forwarded me an application and I said, this is speaking to me right now, like serving my community, giving back to the children, stepping up in a time of need. So that's what I did, Lucy. I got certified to become an elementary school teacher. I was scared shitless. <laughs> I shit my oh. pants. I just want to, for the record, say that. There's no, there's no <laughs> doubt. I mean, I would rather stand in front of, you know, a room full of a thousand adults than a room full of 30 kids. Yes. And especially during the height of COVID, walking into these classrooms and they're like, good luck. We'll see you at 3 p.m. <laughs> you know, and you're like, <laughs> what am I going to do? And you're like, whoa. And these kids were already bouncing off the walls and, you know, um, had lost their routine and, you know, were trying to reacclimate to being in the classroom and their maturity and socialization was definitely, um, had slowed down. And so obviously in New York, we were, our children missed almost two full years of formal education. Imagine the impact that has on elementary school children. They could never get that back. So I'm in a classroom where children, you know, did not know in first grade how to hold a pencil, how to write their name, things that we take for granted, right? That yeah. our children are learning when they're going to school. And here they were in school. They should have already known, you know, how to do these things. And they did not. So it was really like, you know, being thrown into a raging fire and, you know, trying to figure it all out. <laughs> it was, yeah, quite an experience. I, yeah, I, I can't even imagine. I want to go back though to what you were saying about that point in time during COVID when you were trying to figure a lot out, figure out who you were, what you were doing. Um, and you were really beginning to question, you know, am I adding value? What is my legacy? I think that at its core, is what women in midlife really start to question. Mm -hmm. You know, now your kids are still younger, but, you know, and my kids are, are adults now, but I think, you know, it, it is not necessarily dependent on when our kids are moving on with their lives. It's more how we start to see ourselves in right. the world and how we're showing up. Because I think at some point in time, we acknowledge that our role as mothers is changing. Absolutely. And I think that, I mean, listen, I, my boys are teenagers now. They're 15 and 17. And I think that it was the culmination of what was going on in the world, the fact that everything shut down, because the reality is before things shut down, I was just on autopilot like so many moms and dads out there. 
we're in autopilot. We don't recognize it. We're going, going, going. There's like, you're going from one thing to another thing from like your job to getting the kids to school, to making the meal, to taking care of the house, to taking care of your husband. To like, and then I was at a point in my life where I was out of my marriage. My kids were getting older. My job, like I said, you know, overnight just became extinct and I was home doing nothing with myself and just thinking to myself, this, there's an opportunity here. Do not miss it, Eleni. So I got quiet. I got still. And yes, I mean, I think a part of it is, of course, my age, I'm 52 years old. And I'm like, is this all there is to life? There has to be more to it. So I think it was a combination of circumstances, age, you know, um, and creating that space to say, this is my time. Like I did my job raising my children. Do they still need me? Of course, not so much. <laughs> They're self-sufficient. They'll always need you. Minor, like, minor 20, like a, 23. More like an Uber and an ATM and whatever, all those, you know, jokes we make as, you know, um, middle-aged parents. But of course, they see me, still need me. But I feel like, Lucy, I feel like I planted my seeds. I did my work. They have their foundation. I'm still here for them, but the shift is on me now. And this is my time to really um, discover what my passion is and to impact the world in a way that will have lasting meaning long before after I'm gone. And that's what really spoke to me and compelled me to do all these insane things, become a certified elementary school teacher and then a children's author. I would have never, ever imagined I would be doing these things. Now I'm venturing into podcasting. It's just incredible. Once you take one big leap, I feel like, wow, it's just, you know, I, I feel like I'm riding in a convertible going 120 miles an hour with my hair down and like throwing caution to the wind. There's no stopping me now. So that's really powerful. Yeah. And, you know, there are two things you said in there. You questioned, is this all there is to life? Mm -hmm. And you acknowledged it was my time. When you were going through that transition, were you were you always seeing it as a positive or did you have moments? Because for me, I completely hit rock bottom. I had to hit rock bottom to come back up. And it was slow climbing myself back up. But as you said, it got faster and faster and faster. Five years ago, when I hit rock bottom, would I have ever believed that I'd be doing this today? Absolutely not. Right. But every little step I made to pull myself up to move myself forward is brought me here. But for me, it started with a lot of pain, a lot of guilt, a lot of shame. Is that what you experienced or were you, you know, sort of more on the positive side of things? Oh, I hit rock bottom. <laughs> <laughs> I will not sugar. We need t-shirts. <laughs> There's no reason to. I absolutely hit rock bottom. I was in a very dark place. Um, I, you know, for me, when I came out of my divorce, I did not know. I was like, oh, okay, whew, like, thank God that's done. But who am I outside of this marriage? Who am I on my own? And what do I have to offer the world? And that was really scary. And, you know, my divorce was an eight year journey. It was not, it was not a quick divorce. It was not a quick experience. Writing my book, also, I started my, I had a publisher, Lucy, just to give you a little bit of a backstory and for all your listeners. I, my children's book was inspired by my children eight years ago when I was a busy working mom and I was reading to them and I was so exhausted, I couldn't keep my eyes open. And then my children loved, I started telling them made up stories. They fell in love with my storytelling and then in Fired me and nagged me <laughs> incessantly to start writing my stories down. And I did. 
And then when my marriage fell apart, I lost my publisher, I lost my contract, I lost my illustrations, I lost time, money, faith, confidence, you name it. And then my entire life came undone and became unraveled. And that was one of the darkest periods of my life. I felt like there were cracks everywhere. But what I did realize is that that's the only way the light's going to get in sometimes. It's okay if you're feeling broken because I promise you that's where the light's going to get in. And you may not see it in that moment, but I definitely experienced a lot of what you're talking about, like just one foot in front of the other, just fighting and scraping to get through to the end of the day. And then there's the dawn, right? So there was so much of that, Lucy, and I have no regrets whatsoever because it it really made me who I am today. Did you hide it from your friends, what you were going through? No, I did not. And you know what? I love that question. And to a certain extent, I mean, how can I put this? To a certain extent, I didn't even hide it from my children. So let me just um, explain. Like, as a mother, I was protecting my children because, you know, they were much younger. And I felt like I, um, I shared with them what I could, which was your father and I, you know, are not going to be together but we still are a family unit and we always will be and you didn't do anything wrong and all of that. But what I allowed them to see was that I was trying and new things and that I was failing and that I was having emotions that I needed to move through. Um, and I was having, you know, um, days where I was like, mommy is emotional today and mommy needs a hug and you know everything's going to be okay and but I think that that's so powerful to share with our child I'm not saying you know wake up in the morning and say that I don't know what I'm going to do and mommy doesn't have a job and like I'm so scared and like what the fuck and how are we going to fucking get through this I'm not saying that right because you don't put that on the you know shoulders of a child right so there's that you know having awareness of like what can they handle what can you share but I remember days where I was like in my bed and I was like oh, mommy needs to sleep in today mommy needs you know a hug today mommy's having a good cry today and that's okay and especially Lucy because I have boys I have two boys and growing up, I grew up in a Greek American household with immigrant parents. My parents were from Sparta. And that's a part of Greece where they were known for their military. And both my parents were very tough. My father, especially, we could not show any emotion ever. So there was no crying. I'm one of six kids. There was absolutely no crying, no show of emotion. I remember one day, my brother was playing in the backyard. We were all playing together, throwing the football around, and he caught a ball, and he sliced his ear off on an old fountain that my sister had in the back of her yard. They were waiting to come and pick it up, and his ear literally got sliced off. It was lying there on the, on the lawn. He was bleeding. We didn't know if he was going to go deaf, if he was going to be able to hear. It was like... No, nope, none of that. My dad just shut it down. My mom, like, there's no crying. Like, get get a hold of yourself. So that's how I grew up. So I did not want to instill that in my children. So I wanted them to see that I was trying new things, that I was, for lack of a better word, failing, okay? Because I was like, nope, this isn't working. Nope, that's not working. I, I prefer to call it pivoting. Because it was not failure. It was, I tried something and I realized, okay, this isn't for me. 
and then I need to shift my energy somewhere else. So that was an experience that taught me what I don't want to do. And we can make those shifts and those pivots in our relationships, in our careers, and we should. We should. We should ask ourselves, like, is this the relationship I want to be in? Is it serving me? Is it toxic? So because I really feel like to thrive and show up as the best version of ourselves, it needs to be our whole self, our collective self. And the only way to do that is to figure out, is this energy, is this person in my life, is this job in my life, is this experience in my life serving me? Yes or no? There's no, for me, there is no gray area there. It's either serving you or it's not. So either it stays or it's got to go. And I started making those decisions. It's self-awareness. What I'm putting in my mind and my body and who I'm allowing into my circle. Because there's power in proximity. So who are you letting into your circle every day? Are they serving you? And a lot of that comes down to trusting your own intuition. Mm -hmm. You know, and as you alluded to earlier, is that as moms, our lives can be so busy. We're constantly going, we're constantly taking care of everyone else. A lot of the time I find, you know, from the women I've spoken to is we don't slow down to listen to that inner voice. And, you know, for whatever reasons we, when, once you do have that opportunity to slow down and to, you know, and, and you mentioned that you meditate, I meditate, but just to find those moments of stillness and to actually listen to yourself. I think that's a thing that, you know, many of us are afraid to do mm -hmm. because we're almost afraid of what we hear because it may be telling us that we want change and change can be scary and making those pivots can be scary especially when you're in midlife because those, you know, that inner voice comes up and it's, you know, is it too late? Am I too old? You know, is this a stupid idea? What are people going to think? Yeah. And, and it's learning how to actually listen to that inner wisdom, that intuition mm -hmm. and really understand who we are and what we want. I think that's so powerful. Lucy. I love that you shared that. I think so many of us truly are afraid to listen to, to, I think we're afraid to slow down. I think we're afraid to listen. I think we're afraid of change for sure, especially in midlife. We're so accustomed to routines and things being a certain way. And uh, let's call it our comfort zone. I think the comfort zone is the death of the, <laughs> the death of <laughs> intuition, the death of spirit, the death of passion, the death of purpose, I really do. I, I believe the first step is getting out of our comfort zone. But um, after you do that, all the answers come in stillness, all of them. And if we're, we have to be ready to listen. I feel like so many times people ask me, what is intuition? Intuition is I feel like our child's whisper, our child's heart, our child's soulful purpose, right? So if you take it a step further, like close your eyes right now, unless you're driving, <laughs> close your eyes and think about when I was a child, what did I dream about? What was I thinking I would become? what made me feel giddy and happy and silly and carefree. And I think that when we start listening to that voice and to that intuition and start embracing it and honoring it, I think that that's where we could start to build our confidence and even go a step further and find our purpose. I have to say, I never set out to write a children's book. This was not my idea. <laughs> I will say that. As I said, it was my children who inspired me. However, 
I got still. I got quiet. I meditated. I even included this in the foreword of my book. I included the fact that this is a true story. I was meditating. I was like, okay, my kids wanted me to write down my story. So I was like, let me start writing this down, right? <laughs> so it was like, if my kids are enjoying these stories so much, maybe there's something to it, right? So I started trying to collect stories and ideas for stories. But I was meditating. I was doing like a, uh, I love Deepak Chopra and uh, Oprah Winfrey, and they did a meditation series together. So I was doing one of their meditations, and I'll never forget, it was called, Who Am I? And I listened to that meditation. I was very still. I turned everything off. And then after the meditation, I had to, I had an appointment I had to get to, and I was in my bedroom getting ready. And I will never forget, it was this little whisper in my head saying, go sit down on your desktop because you need to get this out. And I was like, no, 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 no. like later, later, it's not a good time. I have to catch the train. I have an appointment. I'm running late. And it would not, it kept getting louder and louder. And I was like, okay, okay. Like I <laughs> literally grappling with, you know, these two voices. And I call one of them my inner villain and the other one my inner hero, right? So my inner villain's like, I, you don't have time for this, Eleni. And then my inner hero is like, go sit down, girl. You need to do this. You'll thank me later. So I sat down on my desktop and the story of Picky Patrick, which is my first published children's book, came pouring out of me, Lucy. I sat at the computer without any intention or thinking about a topic or a subject or any kind of writing guidelines. And I sat there in a frenzy and this story poured out of me. And I was like, wow, this is incredible. Like, this is the gift. And, and the meditation was asking, who am I? And the, and the answer the universe gave me was children's author. So I have embraced this now, and this has become my life's work, my labor of love, my life's legacy, and here I am, a published children's author. You can't make it up. You just no, and, and I think it's important to note that these, you know, our inner wisdom speaks to us at the right time. You know, so for you, it suddenly came pouring out of you. Whereas for me, I find that it's, you know, there's been these little crumbs along the way. It's like, follow this, go here, go there. And, you know, mm -hmm. my journey is very, very different as each of our journeys are very, very different. Right. But I think it is important that you actually find the courage to start to listen to those whispers. Absolutely. Because that's that's the tricky part is you can hear it, you can acknowledge it. And as you said, you've got, you know, your your inner good guy and your inner bad guy. And so often we let the bad guy win. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, turning down that volume. I call I call that that voice it itty bitty shitty committee i turned down the volume <laughs> on that and, and you down. really have to <laughs> you, you have to turn down the volume on that and turn up the volume on the good it doesn't come e it it doesn't necessarily come easy and it takes practice it's it's a muscle like anything else i love that you said that i could not agree more this is a muscle that i have been exercising for years and everybody's journey is different. And the other thing is, learn not to judge your journey. Especially this day and age with social media, we, you know, log on and we're following people and we see things and they're seemingly overnight a best-selling New York author or, you know, started a new business. Or even I'm, I recently got on TikTok and it's just like, not by choice, <laughs> but I, I recently got on TikTok and you see 
women who are like, oh, my boyfriend left me and I was, you know, their body is like, they're 220 pounds and then boom, boom, boom with these little editing apps. And it's like, look at me now. And it is, you know, in, in less than 15 seconds, you see a transformation. It does, we obviously know it doesn't happen overnight. So it is a muscle. It takes great care. And that's why I say honor it because I heard it, but I could have continued on with, you know, I have to get ready. I have to catch my train. I have to, you know, with life. So we have to stop being busy and we have to start being present. Definitely. And so up to ourselves, Lucy, I love what you said. It's like dial up your inner cheerleader, your inner hero, and, you know, dial down your inner villain. That is, that is a powerful message to end on. Now, you have a little gift for listeners, anyone participating in the, in the pod summit, and you're offering 10% off Picky Patrick your first children's book. Mm -hmm. So for anybody participating in the pod summit, if you want to get your code to get 10% off of Picky Patrick, make sure you go to nectargrowth.com. That's N-E-C-T-U-R-E-G-R-O-W-T-H.com. And by being a part of this summit, you will receive the first 30 days free. But I know once you get in there and you start to realize what a fabulous community community it is, you're going to want to stick around. It is also completely away from social media. There's no algorithms. There's no ads. It's just pure, authentic connection with women in midlife, just like you. And I'm going to be starting something very special in Nectar. And it's what I call fireside chats. And that's a chance for us to get together share what we're going through, talk about different experiences. And yes, ladies, we're even going to have a chance to vent. So make sure you join us at nectargrowth.com. You can find the link in your daily emails or check out the show notes. I'm going to have the links in there. Thank you so much for joining us. And Eleni, thank you so much for sharing your story today. Oh my gosh, this was an absolute pleasure. Thank you. This is so powerful. And this is an incredible platform, Lucy. Thank you so much, truly, for having me. And I hope that I'm inspiring your listeners to just listen, be present, and believe in themselves and take that risk and take that chance. I promise you, you will thank us for it. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Roller Coaster Podcast. Want to chat or share your ideas about today's show? Pop me an email at hello at the rollercoasterpodcast.com. Don't forget to connect with me on Facebook and Instagram at the Roller Coaster Podcast. Our theme song, Roller Coaster, was performed by the Lucky Setback. Audio editing by the one and only Jeff Quigley of Quigley Creator. Life is like a roller coaster, baby.